Hello, everybody. Welcome. And this is one of the highlights of the ceremony. It's when you have the opportunity to ask questions of Ajahn Brahma and Ajahn Hasapanya. And the other monks, they know what's going to happen, so they're hiding in the hut. <laughs> We've got a couple of more. Oh no, it's three o'clock already. So, who would like to ask the first question? And when you ask the question, you can always say, This is the question, and this is for Ayahasapanya. Or. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Remember, I didn't mention all Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> <laughs> no, all right, Jan Brahm. So, it's an opportunity because often, you know, we give talks and we teach you, it's almost like lecture. This is, you run the show. So, any feedback as well you have for us, please let us know. So, first of all, we might say, any complaints? You got a complaint, I thought so. So, Please, please say your name and your, um, what's it, your membership number, so we can strike you off the list. <laughs> no. Uh, who's got something to ask? Please put your hand up. Is there any mobile phone? Okay. Ah, oh, very good. So you get all the exercise, uh, Leha. So. Who's got something they wish to ask? No one? Okay, we can go back. <laughs> okay, here we go. Yeah, go on. Yes. Uh, Ajahn, uh, just wondering, uh, with Vesak Day, there yeah. are various um, ceremonies being done over the world. Yeah. Uh, one of the ones I've been to is bathing of the Buddha, can yeah. you explain what's that about? Okay, the bathing of the Buddha, we usually do that in Theravada Buddhism on the Songkran day, which is the New Year's day. And the simile of that is like when you bathe, you take off all of the bad karma, all the dirt off the uh, image of the Buddha. You wash it, make it nice and clean. And that's the symbol for taking away all of your uh, bad karma. And the reason we don't do it here is because everybody here is so clean anyway. They don't do bad karma, therefore it's not necessary. It's also very cold at this time of the year. And maybe some places it's warm, people don't mind being bathed. But they only do that just usually at the, um, the New Year day. So this is something else. We don't usually do the bathing. We do a lot of trying to make sure we understand the Dhamma here. So that's why we have uh, some uh, a time this afternoon where we can ask questions. Okay, next. What do you think about that answer? What do you think about that answer? It's great. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, next question. Come on, Leha, you can ask one as well. Oh, oh, there he is. Hi, Hopkin. <laughs> oh. <laughs> right. Just by the way, Hopkin, yeah. that yeah. deed, you can let Hopkin know that you've got the deed for the, the new land we purchased. You know the new land we purchased? Yes. 142? We've got the deed for that now. Okay. And so it's given to um, uh, Leha. So I mentioned that to you because if the deed goes missing and Leha disappears over into Singapore, we know where to trace it. Anyway, title D is in BSWA's name, isn't it? Oh, yes. Yeah, yes, she can't run away. Can. Yeah. We can get BSWA Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. Yes, your question, okay. please. Anyway, Ajahn, just for the sake of asking question. So, how to live a spiritual life at the same time get involved in, uh, you know, the worldly life, such as uh, share, investing in shares? Okay, now that's an easy question. So, I think that's, I want to give that over to uh, Ayahasapadya. 
Well, I did the last question, so this is fair enough. So I asked Apanya, you got a... Yeah. I don't actually know. <laughs> because I'm... Uh, yeah, because uh, when I started to, to practice and actually I um, started to, to give away most of the things and I stopped a uh, lot of my, I mean, job and then and out of the world for a long, long time. Yes. But I, I was uh, working in the share market when I was a lay person, Ooh. I must say. But honestly speaking, I never play. Because I've seen many people, they're really, some really so rich, they say so overnight, they're all, it's like a gamble. And I don't really believe all the tips. <laughs> yeah. I mean, of course, sometimes you, you still can practice. Actually, there's a one way that actually you bear in mind. A lot of people try to try to fit, you know, the Dharma into their life, but actually it should be the other way around. Your life into your Dharma. That is make the Dharma your life. That is to keep it the top priority. Like for example, you have times to do all sorts of things. Oh, I have no time to meditate. I have no time to do that. But if you do it the other way around. You know, make sure that you know you make it. You know, you you fit. You 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 don't try to fit the dharma into your life, but your life into the dharma. Excellent. Okay. That's a brilliant I answer. Sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry, sorry. So she obviously is much better at answering questions than I am. <laughs> <laughs> so the next question. Ajahn. Uh, Me, not her. Uh, right both. I both. Think. Um. <laughs> I um, just read about something that you wrote oh um, that is about um, how to get cured from illnesses by touching the area of uh, the oh. pain and so on. So now I'm wondering about this COVID, like something like that, how can we overcome such diseases and then what is your way of letting us know what to do about that kind of situations. Okay, well, I think I can tell this story because they're not here today. They were here this morning and they told me a very interesting story that uh, she had COVID, she was a doctor. And her husband started um, coughing very violently. And this coughing, is couldn't stop coughing. And so she came, her husband came into her room at home and said to her, please help, I'm coughing so much, you're a doctor. And she didn't have any medication, they're actually in her room. But then she thought afterwards, I can't just ignore my husband, he's really suffering. So she got some warm water, stirred it up and gave it to him. And I'm not quite sure whether he thought it was a medication or not, but he drank it and he stopped coughing, he never coughed again. So it was a really weird story. But somehow or other, because it was an act of kindness and because it was also, um, maybe he thought it was some medication, it actually stopped. He said it was weird, but it's true. He was there as well and he was saying, yes, this happened only a few days ago. One of the things which I often say is that the mind does have a huge impact on your health. And sometimes these are weird things, but they do sometimes happen. If you're really worried and very uh, concerned about diseases, you end up getting them. But obviously you have to be careful. I have brought my mask here today, but you've got to keep on talking. But after a while, we can get too concerned. That is my view. And sometimes when it gets to the touching of your bodies, this is not something supernatural. It's a good explanation to this. Every disease which you have, every uh, type of um, experience you have, you know, it does manifest on your body. So if you have anxiety, that does have a feeling on your body. If I have anxiety, the way I would experience it would not be the same as you experience it. It's all individual. So once you get to know your body, you're very aware of it, you know those feelings, then sometimes you, it's not like touching it, it's like massaging it giving it kindness. And that kindness, that massage can take away 
the pain and sometimes take away all sorts of other things as well. And it's okay to, obviously it's okay to go to the doctors, I'm not saying you should never go into a hospital, but sometimes that we now have a situation in our world where hospitals are a bit overburdened. And if you want to go there to a hospital, sometimes you put a booking in and it takes a long time to get an appointment unless you are uh, wealthy or unless you know a few sort of ways around the usual way of doing things. And I must admit that sometimes, you know, for monks or for nuns, you try and see who is possible to make sure you get a quick appointment. But it's sometimes difficult. So because of that, it's wonderful to be able to know how to look after yourself if it's necessary. And because of that, that's one of the reasons why being a forest monk and living in these, they were jungles, when I went there 50 years ago in Thailand, you had no choice but to know a lot about just the herbs and other stuff which could uh, save your life sometimes. Well, this is some weird stuff, but I was surprised at this because I was a scientist, a trained scientist, a theoretical physicist. And I remember just once, you know, we were doing some building in uh, this is what banana chart, and there was a gas generator, knowing that there was, very, there was no electricity there at the time. And I wanted to make sure that we can generate some gas so we can make hot cups of tea and things like that. <laughs> but anyway, the way we did it was just using poo. You know, we built a new toilet and we also gathered some of the poo from the water buffalo and we put it in this big pit, put like a, a big tin can on top, you know, probably developed metal, and with a pipe on the top. And the guy who was building this for me, I was designing it, he didn't believe what he was actually making, he thought it would never work. But when it actually worked, we got enough gas, enough methane to actually to boil uh, some drinks for the monks. I became very popular for a few weeks. <laughs> you have a nice hot uh, Ovaltine in the morning. And also, the, the builder, he came up to me and said, I didn't believe this would happen, this is amazing. And then he started telling me about how they had thrown away all of their anti-snake venom in, I know, the the snake venom, and, no, well, anti-venom, that's what it's called, isn't it? The, the anti-venom in the village. There's lots of snakes around. They would never bite the monks, usually, but they bite villagers when they're doing the, the farming in the paddy fields. And so they always had to have some anti-snake venom there. They said, we threw it all away. And the reason was, one of the villagers had this magic chant, and which would uh, cure the the snake bite. And it wasn't a case that these were gullible peasants. They were very smart people. And they said, I had to see it with my own eyes, like your gas generator. I didn't believe it was possible, but it is. And when he actually saw it, and all the villagers saw it, then they threw away the, the anti-venom. And the final part of that story, there was a Singaporean monk. And he actually did, this was after I left, he did get bitten by a snake. And it's when he got bitten by a snake, he actually came into the library, according to the story, opened up the book and said, oh my goodness, that was a highly venomous snake he was bitten by. And so another monk in the library ran into the village. That's one time you can run into the village to get some help. And he came back you know, with this a guy on a motorbike and he was the, the local, well, give him the right word, witch doctor, <laughs> the snake doctor. And they had a look at his leg, could see the puncture wounds, it was swelling up all red, and this poor Singaporean was really concerned. This was life and death. And then the guy who was about to do this stuff, he said, well, this is, should be easy enough. He chewed some herbs, spat it on the wound, rubbed it in, it's not very hygienic. And then started doing some chanting. And doing chanting and spitting on the wound. And that's when the Singaporean said, please, can I have a proper doctor? <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine what it's like. It's interesting for you, but if you know, we had that doctor here and I had a snake, 
any volunteers to prove it's right? Would you volunteer? <laughs> this poor Singaporean was so worried. But then as he was asking for a proper doctor, the wound started to, the, the heat started to heal. The puncture wound started to get smaller and smaller. The redness started to disappear and the whole thing started to subside. In about five minutes, that's all. There was no trace of the puncture wound and there was no swelling anymore. It was all healed. And it was like, almost like unbelievable, but it was real life. And when those sorts of things happen, they make you think again about, you know, what's possible in science. And they trusted this so much that they threw all the anti-snake venom away. Amazing stuff. So that's why sometimes the healing stuff is really weird. And I don't think we use enough our um, intuition and our emotional healing as well. Yeah. Or, or. We do the ones here first of all. Cause give, hi, nice to see you, Jake. How are you doing? Very good. Okay. Okay, yeah. in the first few cases, it seems like, you know, if you believe or psychologically, and you will heal. But in the case of the Singaporean, yeah. he didn't believe he wanted a doctor. So yeah. how did the healing, I mean, through whose belief though? Was it the shaman's belief or his own belief? Because he wanted a doctor. Obviously, he didn't believe yeah. in the shaman's spitting. So how it was, did... It wasn't so, belief at all. There was something real happening there. Now, that's a fascinating which I which I like to focus on. Why is there is nothing which is belief, no superstition there? And it happens to all these people in the village. It's something much more than belief. So what if the shaman passes away? Oh, then he usually gives his uh, train to another person to, with that knowledge. But usually the next person they train is never as good as the first person. So eventually they'll probably get some anti-venom eventually. But that was actually fascinating, the things you actually see and what can be done. Okay, I've got a question from overseas here. <coughs> this is from Gloria, who will be one of the ones taking new precepts today. I want to ask a silly question. If you want to ask silly questions, you're welcome as a member of our Buddhist Society of West Australia. Sometimes people are always too serious. How to deal with cockroaches after taking the five precepts? If those cockroaches have taken the five precepts, then you should look after them. They're holy cockroaches. <laughs> the best way of dealing with cockroaches is actually to make sure your kitchen is nice and clean. And what we do in Bodhinyana Monastery, we had an infestation of cockroaches many years ago. And then we had a bit of way of, tr of catch capturing them without killing them, and it, but it took a long time. And one of our Anagarikas thought it was a bit too much hard work. So he decided to get some expert advice. So who should he ring up to get some expert, expert advice about how to capture cockroaches? He called up the health department of our local council. <laughs> that was not a smart thing to do. <laughs> and so they came and had a look and said, we got to exterminate these within two or three days, otherwise we'll close you down. And that was a terrible situation. And, you know, that we're putting in a position we couldn't do anything about. So anyway, we had to do that, but that was the last time. I made sure, and we do this every week now, the Anagarikas, every, no, it's the first day of the month, Tuesday. They just all work to take everything out of the kitchen and to clean it up. You know, you know our kitchen, many of you have been there. On that Tuesday morning, everything gets taken out, cleaned out. They're not really looking for cockroaches so much as mice. There's lots of mice, especially, do you have mice at, body, at uh, Damasara? We have most of our mice are in the office. <laughs> Click. Oh, you should have seen that coming. <laughs> 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 
Okay. Do you want to add to that answer? We just uh, have to keep the. We will do the same thing too. Uh, every month we have a money cleanup, so we take all the things from the cupboard. If we clean it, we put it back, and we do that every month. And we have no cockroaches. And actually, yeah, if you keep your place clean, make sure that you clean it. Actually, there's no such a problem, especially with any food and things like that. Make sure that you. Clean it, and you know. So yeah, you will not have that problem if you keep your place clean. This is the only way to keep yeah. up. Very good. Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> Just now wasn't a real question. <laughs> Since we touch about kitchen, when are we going to commence building of kitchen at Budiana? I understand you already approved it. Yeah. Now, it's very easy, as you know, having been on the committees for such a long time. To approve things is easy, but how to do it is the hard one. And so you've got to get a plan. And when you get the plan done, then you've got to put it through the council. And then you put it through the council and they say you have to do it another way. And so we have another plan and then they have to go through this other department and then somebody comes up with a better idea. So we do another plan. And so it makes so many plans before you actually can get approval. And by that time, time has moved on and people got other ideas of how to build kitchens. And so it goes on and on and on and on. And yeah, exactly, that's what sometimes I do. So sometimes I give these plans, that um, job over to somebody else. So that job is mainly Ajahn Bamali's job. Where's he now? <laughs> Singapore. Yes. So he's got to come back and do it. When he comes back, then where's he going? Retreat, Suta retreat. And then where's he going? He's going to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we don't get things done. <laughs> but anyway, they started. Started thinking about it, started planning it. At the moment, one of the reasons it's hard to do is it's, I saw this in the ABC website, it's hard to do anything these days because to getting the, uh, the workers and getting the infrastructure, like even getting things like metal, is hard to get. And because of that, we're very fortunate, we're just doing a Bodhinyana monastery, an ablution block, and the builders have gone really fast, and the reason is because they do use their own little, almost like family, a group of people, and they always do the jobs together, so it's very easy for, to arrange for them. And it's also, they manage to order everything quite quickly. So, we're very fortunate with that particular builder, but doing something like a kitchen, it's much harder, as you should know, doing renovations or additions than doing an original building. So, but anyway, it will get done. But it's also important for Buddhists to understand that one of our key principles is patience. And I don't know why people are so impatient and they want a kitchen to be done now. I'm just hanging out for a few more years and our kitchen will be heritage value and you won't be able to touch it. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in trouble. John, can you explain the difference between patience and procrastination? Procrastination, I, I will tell you the difference later on. <laughs> so, Ajahn, am I allowed to ask a question? Okay. While waiting for the next question, so people can start thinking of the next question. Um, Ajahn, I understand you've just finished a retreat, a Thai retreat, together with Venerable Munisara? Yes, I have. So, um, what do you think of um, the nuns teaching? And um, I, I think we got a question during AGM as well. Yeah. So, what's, what's your view about nuns teaching? I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Why does that sound so familiar, Ajahn? <laughs> no, my view of nuns teaching it's important. My job is to make the opportunities open for people. 
And I will never actually tell anybody, you must teach. I never force anybody to do anything. But what, it, it, except procrastinate. I'll force you to procrastinate. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing is, it's up to the, the bhikkhunis, the nuns. And, you know, to, when you have a bhikkhuni who's really smart, well, these two are really smart. No, Venanalio. Now, they may say no, 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 but they are. <laughs> and the same with Venerable Jodhika. She's incredibly smart. Yes. Yeah. So, sometimes the best thing to do is why not ask them? Venanalio. Why? Do you want to do some teaching? Kids, take up the, the microphone. <laughs> Look what a great teacher, just her smile is, is very endearing. And her patience, her procrastination. I'm very proud you outdo me with procrastination. Um, yeah, I mean, personally, I, I, don't f I, I personally don't feel quite ready yet myself, but I think there are other nuns who maybe, you know, I mean, it's... Venerable hey. <laughs> Analia, uh, when did I give my first talk? A big talk. At, at, uh, what was it? Uh, I don't know. Four. It was at the big full moon festival, festival called, uh, what's it called again? Um, no, not Asala Puja. Maga Puja, yeah. A Maga Puja. What Ajahn Chah used to do, he used to look down the line of monks. And I thought he would give a talk. And there was about four or five thousand people there, as well as about a couple of hundred monks. And the great Ajahn Chah, he looked down the line of monks. And when he got down to the bottom of the line of monks, to me, I got very worried, but he went past me. And then his eyes went back up again and said, Brahma Wangso, get up and give the talk. And I had to give the talk, and I never thought I was ready, especially not ready to give a talk in front of your teacher and 4,000 uh, people in Thai. But I did it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so give the talk next Friday. <laughs> My eyes are watching you, so if I go past you, you get to Jyotika. Jyotika, you give it a try. <laughs> You never think you're ready, honestly. But you just do it. And what the monks say to me, they say that when they first give their talk, they think, oh, I don't really want to do this. But they get such wonderful feedback back. And they get such good feedback that uh, they realize that they, they have learned so much. And I remember talking to Ayan Chandra about this. He said, because you're a renunciant, you actually live this teaching. Whatever you say comes across with far more depth and power. And you help out other people and you get incredible feedback. You know, just I, I used to have this, all these letters you get back, people saying thank you for saving my life and all of that. And they many meant it. And they send those to you. And then you never ever feel that you should never give talks. Brilliant. Give it a try. You get so much benefit from it. And it's the same with you, Venerable Jyotika. I know you can teach, but you know, you may think you haven't got enough reins. Have you got more than four reins? Yes, I know you have. <laughs> so that's why it's great to do. So, give it a go. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I've got a bit of silence. Can I say something? Yes, of course. Uh, actually, yeah, I, I'm never worried about the nuns, whether they can teach. I think most of them, they can talk, they can teach. But one of the problem, actually, the main problem we are having, actually, we truly short of staff. Because the more senior one, they have to train the younger one. So now, like, for example, we have two uh, 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 summonary ordination coming up, 
and then one is in uh, uh, in Ju July is a pikuni ordination. Actually, they are the one looking after the younger one because I can't do everything. Actually, like for example, Analia, Vampa Munisara, and oh, they are the one that teach. They have to teach Vinaya. You know, we have Vinaya class, and then they teach them how to sew and about the core what, how to keep the rules. They are doing the help, helping me to do the training, and then now we have some nun sent to Santi. <laughs> So there's a, I don't have enough nun even to go around within my, <laughs> you know, within. The, if I send that up, who is going to do the job? I can't do all the job. <laughs> so they said, they said like Ajam, Ajam Ram just now said, be patient, okay? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> because of we are, we are quite, you know, com compared to the monks, we are quite young, you know. Yeah, and, and I, I, I'm 71. <laughs> I mean, young community. We are the young. I mean, com young community. And actually, to, to, to build monastery, it's easy to build nuns. Actually, it takes many many years to, to really to develop. And then you know, the teaching. Actually, they're all very good. They're all the the, the, the most senior one. They're teaching all the younger one. Mm. Like we, we have anagarikas coming in, and they teach them how to do how to do the bow, how to wear ropes, all these things. Like we, we, we even have like sewing class. Like remember, remember Jotika giving the sewing class. <laughs> and then quite a few nuns attend, attended the, uh, the, the, the sewing class. So we have sewing class, we have Vinaya class, and then, and then they also teach them with the chanting, you know, uh, how, to, how to deal with the ropes and bows like that. So they, they, they need to have someone to teach them. I, I can't do everything myself. And that's why I, I do need them, you know. And especially sometimes I travel, so I'm not here, I have to go. Now I've been traveling between Santi and, and Damasara. So then they have, to, they, have to, they have to be at the monastery to look after the monastery. We have almost 600 acres, lots of work. <laughs> Well, Actually, behind the scene, you don't know. Sometimes they're really tired, stressed out. I mean, they, they have to go back to meditate. So if we, they have teaching again, it's a, too much on them. So because we are now more focused on, we are more a training monastery. So until when we have a, like, we come up to 30 nuns, like uh, body and nun, they have 30 monks, you know. I mean, that time maybe, yes. But now we don't really have that many nuns yet. So... I hopefully that you'll be I mean, a bit patient because I, some of them, I, I think they, keep, they start to teach. We do have like from time to time, but I don't really force them because they also have other responsibility. And most of our nuns, they have a few responsibilities. You know, the, you know, some of them that do maintenance, maintenance nuns do the fire. And Analia have many, many things to do. She's the fire warden. She's the mentor of the, of the Anagarikas and the, and the, and the Samaneri. And she's also doing the store. It's very busy. <laughs> yes. And I know the kuti that, um, uh. you know, where that was being built. So yeah, I yeah. totally agree. And then the last time we were there was just last week. Yeah. Um, the nuns were busy in the garden unloading sand. So mm -hmm. I can see how busy yeah. they are. Because so we you. try to do some of the work before Wasas, because during Wasas we don't work. And also, uh, uh, with all the landscape, with all the plants, actually it's not for beautifying, because we are in a, a gravel, we are gravel pit, and then we have all, all around surrounding is all the embankment, so we need to always revegetate uh, because some of the plants die. Actually, that's to help to hold the soil. If not, when there is one in 100 years or 50 years rain come, I tell you, our whole monastery will cover with mud. So that's why we, we, we have to keep at uh, every every year we have like plant plantings like for example some of those date trees have to remove and we plant it. Actually it's not only for beautifying, actually we need to secure all the embankment with all the we have to revegetate our whole area and we've been planting thousands of you know plants, many thousands, I think six thousands. 
Yes, yeah. but c- can you not get lay people to do that job, no. like hire somebody no, to we, get the we, nuns we, a bit more of a rest? No, no, yeah, we, we do have lay people helping, but the nuns also have to involve. They have to tell them where to do, what to do. Someone have to be there because they don't know where's the thing. And someone have to be there because some of us, we can't dig, we can't do some of the things. We do have, we do have volunteers. We do have volunteers come and help. But the nuns do have to involve. Yeah, but even like she pay somebody to huh? have, a, have a landscape. No, we, 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 we pay. We, but because some of this job is not a big, it's not big enough job. Like, for example, we just replace, you know, uh, that is not a big enough job to, to get someone to do it. They don't want to do it because it's too small a job. Well, maybe some of our members here mm-hmm. can actually just the volunteer to take yeah. over that, to give... This is the monks that we've got the same problems. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the monks are way too busy. And we want to make sure that the monks, again, also mm-hmm. have more opportunities mm-hmm. for being peaceful and doing what monks are supposed to do, mm-hmm. what nuns are supposed mm-hmm. to do. That in many countries in the world, the monks and nuns don't work that's yeah. this hard. Oh, actually, yeah. we only work in the morning. We don't work in the afternoon. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what this is. A, because normally, or, or normally we, don't, we only work in the morning. Yeah. So that's like, uh, that's it. I, I always I tell them, if you can't finish tomorrow, continue. Uh, do, today you do it tomorrow. Tomorrow yeah. you can't finish, you do it then. <laughs> it's, a, yeah. it's just like what you used to say, if uh, yeah. Ajahn Buddha Dasa said that what time well, is finished. Time is finished yeah. So yeah, actually we take it easy, but some of the job like is quite, yeah. I mean, we, we, we usually, we do have some volunteers uh, to help yeah. us. We do have, uh, they come and help with, like, for example, some of the painting, some yeah. of the mulching. Actually, we, we can't do it because not many, not many nuns is strong. Yeah. Some of them, like, physically, they can't even, even, even lift more than a two kilos, you know, one kilo. <laughs> they can't do it. Actually, actually, the... Actually, the, the, the volunteers help us, and also the lay people staying in the monastery, they help us a lot uh, with the garden. But it's only a seasonal, it's not, we don't do it all the time, because you, you, we can only do it when, when rains come, and only that's it, and then after that, that's it, no more. Every year, only that time we do that. It's not, all, it's not like all year round we're doing it. Less than 10 times we do certain things. Like bushfire season, we have to do the fire. fire uh, uh, there's preparation for the bushfire season come. So cleaning gutters and things like that. We do ask people to help, but we have such a big property. Even people come and help, but the nuns also have to be around and supervise. And, and also on top also, they have to look after the younger one with the training. And we don't have 30 nuns like body and I, they have 30 monks. So, and then they have a smaller property compared to us. Oh, no, no, <laughs> we, we bought some new land, remember? But, but still less than us. I oh, know, it's about the same, we're about equal now. <laughs> and 30 monks, most of those monks are young monks, they need a lot of training. <laughs> <laughs> but look, I must yeah, apologize yeah, for yeah. giving I has a penny a hard time because you know what today is, don't you? Yeah. It's her birthday. Yeah. You go on. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Arjun Hasapanya. Happy birthday to you. Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, actually, yeah, I'm, 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 they, they will come, you know, come to the point, but normally I don't force them, you know. And some of them, they feel like they, they want to have more, you know, uh, spend more time training before they... They do give t- talk. We do, like, sometimes that we do. Like, in a monastery, we do give, you know, dana time when I'm not around. Actually, the nuns conduct the ceremony and that they give shot teaching and they've been doing it you know yeah they've been doing it so hopefully we have more nuns and we'll be you know so just patiently just be patient <laughs> it will happen okay why let's... not you make the most uh, the of it while we are still alive when we die when we all 
even if it, you, 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 can't, you can't listen to Ajahn Brahm anymore. So don't worry, they will come up, they keep teaching. So now since Ajahn Brahm still around, you make the most of him, you know, you listen yeah, to his okay. Dharma talk. So the nuns will come out, don't worry, okay? Okay, it's, it's time I went to Singapore for a long time. Good idea? Go to Singapore for a long time? No, then you have I has a padia. <laughs> no, no, whatever. No, I shouldn't be naughty anymore. Yes, next well, one. Well, I, I tell you what, if you do find yourself down at Dharma Loka, you know, amongst all the busyness, you're always welcome to come and sit with the Kalyana friendship community. So we're friendship, not frying. <laughs> it's, it's a nice soft landing. <laughs> Very kind. Oh, wait there, yeah. go on. Um, but I, I had a deeper question, actually. So... We're here celebrating Visak, and as I understand it, it is the day the Buddha was born, the day he achieved enlightenment, and the day he passed away. So we've been having a bit of a yarn um, with our round the kitchen table after KFC lately, and someone asked the question, what's, what's, so what's the difference between enlightenment an extinguishment, and what happens to consciousness? Hmm. So, okay. let's go on a deep question. No, that's pretty simple. Because it's... <laughs> when a person, like, under the Bodhi tree, that's when the Buddha became enlightened. Which means what was extinguished at that point was his um, greed, hatred and delusion. So he was perfectly wise from that point. His consciousness had not been extinguished yet. He taught for another 45 years. And so then we have the Parinibbana. And the word Pari means like complete, total, full. And the word Parinibbana means that's the full cessation. Use the word cessation instead of extermination or annihilation because cessation refers to a process. The process is one thing has caused another, it's caused another, it's caused another, it's caused another. And that is the process of a human being traveling through samsara, wandering, wandering from place to place. And this is when the Parinibbana, that's when that whole thing has now ceased, without remainder. Apariseza means without remainder, Nibbana. It's ceased, it's gone. And no, no remnant at all. Now, for many people, that's a bit difficult for them to understand, even though that's very clearly stated in the suttas. And there's basically no logical way around that statement. But because people, they don't want to be extinguished, it's almost like we feel that we've worked so hard to become enlightened, we mean we can't enjoy it afterwards. <laughs> And, but the point was, even the Buddha said, even a little bit of dung on your finger stinks. Even a little bit of existence still is a problem. And he said so many times, this is no more consciousness left. The consciousness is one of the five candors. And the Buddha said all types of consciousness, and no, no matter how you deal with it, is finished. But is that you being destroyed? Of course it's not, a, it was never a you to begin with. This is one of our assumptions of a self, of a me, who wants to do things, wants to enjoy things, wants to hold things. And that assumption, that wrong view has been, that has vanished. So you know you're just this, one, this lovely process. You're not a man, you're not a woman, you're not a nun, you're not a monk, you're not English, you're not Thai, you're not uh, Asian. You just, this is the process. And then that process changes from place to place. And then after a while, it reaches its end. And the process finishes. What's driving that process is like desire, wanting. It's amazing what things we want. Imagine that if Nibbana is total happiness, you don't want anything. And then because you don't want anything, there's nothing driving the process any further. Now, you don't have to accept that, but that's the truth. Ajahn Brahm puts his hand up and, and sometimes 
you know, you've defended that. Some people think you're crazy, but you quote the suttas. There's no answer, no objection from the suttas, the word of the Buddha. Nor is there any answer when you get into these deep meditations. And you see that's so, so true. In the deep meditation, so many things vanish. And all those things you thought you were disappear. And instead of seeing yourself as a being, an Ajahn Brahm or English or senior monk or whatever, all that disappears, you're just a process. And that process starts to come to an end. And when you actually really see it, it's beautiful. And that's why the Buddha even said a, a real stream winner, as soon as that happens and you actually see that's the process. You may not have ended the process totally yet, but you know it's going to end. And that brings so much joy to you. You understand all, <coughs> all these years of rebirth are now at an end. That's, that's gorgeous. That's why of those three things which happened, the birth, enlightenment and final passing away, to me the most important was the final passing away at Kusinara. People always just worship at Bodh Gaya, you know, in, uh, under the Bodhi tree thing, that was really important. But to me the most important place was at Kusinara, under the twin sal trees. That's when the Buddha passed away and never came back. Just not never came back, didn't go anywhere, disappeared. The nicest simile, which makes it easy to understand, this is the Buddha's simile. You know, he used the simile of a flame. So, you know, you're a flame. And you're only a flame because of what's fueling it. The oil, the wick, and the heat. And that when any one of those things is exhausted, there's no oil left, the wick is all burnt out, or the heat is blown out by the wind or someone blowing it, then the flame stops. It doesn't get extinguished. Well, they call it extinction, that's our name for it. But because all the causes for it have stopped, then the effect stops. And the nice thing about that simile, that in the suttas, they use the word Nibbāna for when a flame goes out. We see that in the Ratana Sutta, for those who know the Ratana Sutta. Uh, Nibba, Nibbanti dira yatayang padipo. Nibbanti is like the verb associated with the noun Nibbāna. Nibbanti, it Nibbānas, just like the flame of a lamp. And so that gives all the, the clues there that, you know, who you think you are, it just goes out. The fuel which keeps it going stops. And you stop too. You're gone. Gone, baby, gone. Please excuse me for making a bit of levity at the end, but I can't resist it. <laughs> That's also why they say like Tathagata for a Buddha. It's gone, one is gone. And it's also why in the time of the Buddha, or just afterwards, they didn't have any Buddha statues. You see the old representations in those days, they had carvings. They would have the footprints with no foot in it. They would have the Bodhi tree with a seat under, but no one sitting in it. And they would, what are the other ones we had? Uh, just symbols of emptiness, of no one really being there. So that was a deep question. You may not agree with it, but that's the answer. And eventually when one gets deeper into meditation, this is what one sees. But even as some, even monks, senior monks, still go into deep meditation and can't see it. But that's what Ajahn Chah would always tell me. Remember he said, there's nothing. My me I. That's what he meant. In a process, and one day, the process comes to an end. To me that's beautiful, yeah. Okay, anyway, I'll really get off on that. Um, well, one of the sayings I just, um, which always, well, it's, it's profound. Yeah. Um, 
When the Buddha said, everything I've experienced is in this fathom-long corpse. Yeah. Keep. Yeah, sorry? Yeah. yeah, I think it's... Can you repeat, repeat the saying, everything? Um, everything I have experienced is within this fathom-long corpse. Okay, like this fa fathom-long body. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that? Cause yeah, the way I remember that saying is the Dhamma... All the Dhamma is in this fathom-long body and mind. In other words, you don't look for any tr uh, truth, or he didn't look for any truth in books, there weren't any books then, or in teachers. You look for it inside. And the body and the mind, which is this entity, which you can identify as your vehicle you know, in this life, that all of those teachings can be found inside there. Not from a, a teacher outside of you, not from some god or some avatar or something. This is actually coming from within you. And that's very powerful. But actually how to get inside of you, how to open that thousand petal lotus, as I sometimes I, I call it, and get right inside. That is the pow power of the meditation, to actually see what's inside of you. Make sense? Great. Okay. Thank you for that question. Do you want to add to that? I don't want to add to the answer. The nuns are very good teachers, you know. <laughs> okay. Oh, can I say something? Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. My is question is regarding our human mind, you know, and the current world situation. Yeah. And reflecting on what's in front, Ajabam, your famous saying, make peace, be kind, be gentle. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You see, currently, there is, how do I say, uh, uh, like provocation, you know, to starting wars, you know, and all, all these fightings going on. Yeah. Or, you know? yeah. And then, as though there's not enough, I just heard the news this thing that there is uh, what I call this Finland. Sweden going to join NATO, all these things, and so not enough, you know, and threatening world war, you know, fighting all these things, you know. So my question also is, is why do human minds you now we have to degrade? So, we have to degrade to so low, you know, okay, as to, to 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 how do I say to stoop to all this fighting, encouraging fighting, you know. Indeed, some human beings. Uh, very high-minded. Some human beings are low-minded, and some human beings. Sometimes you just wonder, just maybe some of those people have been born, you know, from some of the lower realms. When I, people ask me about rebirth, reincarnation, how can there be reincarnation when there's more people alive today than have ever died in history? It's a very, a very good calculation, easy calculation in maths. And so, where did everybody come from? And then you also know that the number of uh, tigers, leopards and gorillas have gone down as the number of bikies and, <laughs> and generals have gone up. <laughs> so I mean that's a little bit uh, um, speculative, but there's a lot of case to when a human being you know, is born they get born from this life and then to another life and then to another life. And sometimes when they first get born, they don't really have that much experience. And almost like the laws of the jungle of survival are most important. But later on, people get more advanced in just their understanding in their minds. And those uh, more advanced minds spend more time making peace. This is not telling people what to do. This is advising them. This is a smart way for high-minded people. And by the way, that when I was in Singapore, people asked me, please say thank you to Eddie. Oh. Because now I'm going to say this, Eddie, that they said uh, that he's a hero in Singapore. <laughs> and they say that they like his, <laughs> they like his oh. questions. <laughs> and so please keep on answer, ask, answer, asking those questions, Eddie. Thank you very much, Adam Brahm. I don't even think of all these heroes or great things. I don't think of that. <laughs> yes, because that's you're just into making peace, being kind and being gentle. Oh. 
<laughs> Thank you. Okay, another qu question. How about a question for Ayaha Sapanya? Okay, good. Yes, Conrad. Well, it's, it's really for either and um, prompted by uh, the earlier question from Sandra about consciousness and um, cessation. Is it that um, before Parinibbana, someone or the pe one will experience cessation of consciousness, that they'll experience what it's like for consciousness to finish before Parinibbana? And if, yeah. <laughs> if that's the case, how, how do you know? How does someone know that consciousness is finished if it's not there at the time? Yeah. Do you want to ask something, Tajan Brahman? Yeah, oh, that's very nice. <laughs> nice to see you. Okay, who's that too? That's two questions, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you understand what consciousness uh, is, remember, in Buddhism, there's six different types of consciousness. It's not one consciousness. And people sometimes think that six consciousnesses are just the mind is like underneath all the other consciousnesses. It's a separate type of consciousness and knowing. And that's what happens in deep meditation. You just go so deep, that's all that's left, the mind consciousness. And when you know what the mind consciousness is and how it interferes with the other five consciousnesses, you also understand that this consciousness uh, it comes and goes, even the mind consciousness. It doesn't last. It's the nature of all things. And this is how you see it changing. And as it changes, there's nothing essential underneath. How do you know that, the, like stuff, the atoms, subatomic particles, there's no one subatomic particle, no one thing which makes up stuff. It's always changing every moment. And you can't find actually one thing which is essential. And that's why sometimes even the consciousness is always changing. Because most people don't understand what it actually is. And some people, even some scientists say it doesn't even exist. Which is actually crazy. It's one of the reasons I gave up science. People weren't being logical. Because they were just believing what they wanted to believe. And that, you need consciousness, you need observation, even in quantum physics. Without that, it, the world doesn't exist. So because of that, that when you understand what consciousness, that consciousness, mind consciousness actually is, you see it comes and goes and it starts to vanish. And in, okay, I'm going to go for broke here. In the jhanas, you know, the, first of all, the mind separates from the five senses and gets incredibly still and also very mindful. The highest state of mindfulness, according to the Buddha, is the fourth jhana. That's the purity of mindfulness. And then once you're there, then the mind starts to disappear, vanish. And those are the arupa, immaterial states. And once you start getting into those, you see just this mind, what it's actually made of, as it starts to vanish and disappear. And that's why just before it disappears, in these amazing states, these are real states, state of neither perception nor perception. What the heck can that be? And that is just where, when you come out of the meditation, you can't do anything when you're in there, you're just gaining data. When you come out, out after the meditation, you find that these states, you know, look at it one way, and you perceive you're not perceiving. Sounds like an oxymoron. But that's just the mind finally about to pass away, to cease. And for many times it ceases because you see the way in, you see that it's vanishing. While you're in there, of course, you can't experience anything. Consciousness has ceased. But then it comes back again. That's, you know, in the jhanas. And this is just, you know, the way this mind works. It can pause for a long time. Okay, those are magical states, but I don't mind talking about those things because they're real, they do actually exist. And sometimes people get into them and they're weird, they're safe, and they're fascinating to talk about. This is not superstition, this is reality, which for many people they don't see. It's one of the reasons why I want people to get into these deep meditation sajanas. You can do it. In the time of the Buddha they could do it. Why not today? And what happens then? 
is that it gives you the full picture of what you know, this meditation is and answer some of these very deep questions. I don't know if that helps you or not, or makes you more confused, but I'll try my best. Uh, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, sorry, just so curious. Yeah. So, I think what I was reading when I read the Parinibbana Sutta, the Buddha seemed to, as he was passing away, he seemed to go through the jhanas. So one, two, three, four. Yeah. Then he came back again. No, he, he went actually he, into the Arupas. Uh, what, so what, what's, what's that about? Why did he... Why did he do that? Why did he do that? The <laughs> only reason we could know that is because Anuruddha was there and he could read the mind of the Buddha. He knew what was going on. He could connect with the Buddha, which is an amazing thing to do. And so he was saying that the Buddha is now going through the four jhanas and then from the four jhanas to the Arupa states to the cessation of consciousness and feeling and the perception and feeling. And then he came back again to the fourth jhana and he exited samsara from there. That's a fascinating question, but why he exited from the fourth jhana is, uh, it do all our hearts have to do that? And the all enlightened beings are the same. Okay, well, some can be men, some can be teachers, some can be monks, all sorts of things, but that's actually the way they have to, to leave for the fourth jhana. So from there you get into the real cessation. Through the arupa states, you can always come back again through the fourth jhana and then cease then you never come back you're gone it's a good question because I remember Venerable Sister Gotami's uh, brother when he was alive he was a, a Theravada monk and he came and stayed with me over in the Monastery for a while and we had these discussions and that was his thesis why did it actually happen? Why did the Buddha have to go out of samsara for the fourth jhana? Which was weird. And that's probably the solution. But of course, you know, you have to know what those jhanas are before this even conversation has much meaning. That's why I love people to be able to understand what these jhanas are and achieve them. Not so much achieve them, but experience them. And every now and again, Lay people do that. And when they do, I'm so happy. More people can taste what Buddhism really is. Brilliant stuff. Anyway, yeah, okay. Good question, and the answer is yes. When I first, please, I have to say this because this is one of those really inspiring things for me. That when I read it's the Chula Hatipadopa Masutta, it was the first teaching which the Arahat Mahinda gave when he landed in Sri Lanka. And I often thought, why did he choose to give that teaching? And in it, it says, if you want to understand what the Buddha is, it's like trying to find an elephant. You know, sometimes you can see trees which have been damaged or like branches have been torn off. It may be an elephant, may not be an elephant. When you actually see the elephant, or the footprint, or the big footprint, you know that must be a huge elephant. And he said in the same way that when you can experience even the first jhana, then you can actually understand that this, you found the first footprint of the Buddha. And not only that, when the Buddha talked and described those jhanas, one of the epithets, one of his descriptions, was called Sambodhi Sukha. Sambodhi means enlightenment. Said so even that what you experience in that first jhana is enlightenment happiness. And that really struck me. It's not enlightenment, but it's so close. You really get a taste of what enlightenment is. Your first taste. Sambodhi Sukha. And that's why everybody experiences the same thing. Which means that if you get into a jhana, 
stay there for a while, when you come out afterwards, you realize you've experienced what the Buddha experienced. No different. You've experienced what Sariputta, Mahamogalana, Kisago Gotami, Patachara, all the great bhikkhunis, what they experienced as well. No difference in those days. And to me that always creates goosebumps. You're connected in a very, very profound, deep spiritual way. Same experience. No different. When you come out afterwards, then you're, you know, you're who you are. But then, in that experience, the body has disappeared and the mind is pure. That's how the Buddha experienced it. And now you got me, this is supposed to be just a, a Q&A, but thank you, I get, I get really inspired by this. Please excuse me. Anyway, have we gone over time? Or should we have another question? Jan, I think we need to move on to the chanting before the new Buddhist service. Okay, yeah, okay. What are we supposed to chant now? <laughs> <laughs> it comes, honestly, chanting is important, but it's a bit of a downer. <laughs> <laughs> what, are we ch what, what are we supposed to chant now? I don't know, I saw on the program it says chanting and blessing. I'm thinking the uh, volunteers. Oh, volunteers, yes. A blessing for the volunteers. So, how many volunteers are here today? How many people volunteer in any which way? Please come up to the front. Now, come on, you deserve it. Uh, the president's a volunteer. All the Thai people, you're a volunteer setting up stuff. Prem volunteer to put up the lanterns. Any which way you volunteer, Prem is always volunteering, so come closer. <coughs> He's acknowledging the people, Manel there who runs the library, Lucky who volunteers looking after our members. You're, come on, Leha to you, a volunteer as well as anything. So please come, and you volunteer to set up the Wednesday group, come on, come to the front. All those ties at the back, churn kama, kama, and <laughs> and is this Cecilia under the mask? Is it? Yeah, you always volunteer to help out somewhere or other. I'd invite Jake up, but then uh, <laughs> nobody looking after the the AV. And many of the other, you all volunteer. Come on, Eddie, you volunteer. Lady is the one who's our um, negotiator for land purchases. And you, actually, you're a volunteer. You might all come up to the back front. <laughs> and all those people online who are watching, you know, you're all volunteer and help so much. Sometimes you think it's just the monks and the nuns, but there's no way it's just monks and nuns. It's each one of you. You know, some of you bring breakfast every morning. And you can see how effective that is, how fat I become. <laughs> so anyway, all you volunteers throughout, we want to sort of um, uh, just express our gratitude to all of you in a way which, you know, once a year, never think that you are not appreciated. Never think that all your hard work is never seen. Sometimes you think that, oh, no one notices us. We do notice you. And you are the Buddhist society, even more than the Sangha is. We're just out front, just you know, just like you have these big ships and have these these headpieces at the front. But you know, you are the ones who are actually rowing those boats and making sure it doesn't sink. So far, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all. You're appreciated enormously, and even the people who are still sitting in the back there, you help out enormously. I know that. And so, it's appreciation. So, we can do the Shula Mangala? The Sabha Buddha Nubhavena? Yeah. This is a Chula Mangala Sutta. This is a longer version of a nice blessing for you. And the appreciation which you know, the Sangha has for you, but also the committee and the Buddhist society. 
We have Cherry over there. How long have you been working for our Buddhist Society in West Australia? <laughs> Since the year, Dodd, I know you started working for us uh, when I first came here, and that was 39 years ago. So it works a, a lot. And, and Lucky as well. There's all of you. A boon in the back there, a treasurer, and goodness knows what else. So, and you still help out in all sorts of different ways. Would you like to add a bit about our volunteers? How much they help out? Yeah. Anyone want to say anything? They help, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you already said everything. I can't say anything. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's give some chanting for you all. And this is meaningful. Saba Buddha Nubhavena Saba Dhamma Nubhavena Saba Sangha Nubhavena Buddha Ratanang Dhamma Ratanang Sangha Ratanang Tinang Ratananang Anubhāve na chaturā siti sahasa dhamma khandā Anubhāve na pitaka kaya Anubhāve na jīna sāvaka Anubhāve na sābhete roga sābhete bhaya Sabe te antarai, sabe te upadawa, sabe te dunimita, sabe te awa mangala, winasantu ayuadako, danawadako. Siri Wada Ko Yasa Wada Ko Bala Wada Ko Wana Wada Ko Sukha Wada Ko Hota Sabada Dukha Roga Baya Vera Sukha Satu Chupadawa Aneka antara yapi vina santu teja sajaya siddhi dana lava soti bhagaya sukang balak siri ayu chawano chabogang wudi chayasawa Satawa Satcha Ayu Cha Jiva Siddhi Bhavan Tite That's really excellent. That's the strength of our Buddhist society. Look at all of the uh, people here, our volunteers. They come from so many different backgrounds. You got the traditional Buddhists, the new Buddhists, the ex-Catholics, the ex-I don't know what else. <laughs> and it's wonderful to see you all, all different faces, all different people, different jobs, different professions, but still find time in your own way to help serve this Buddhist society in Western Australia. And it's a wonderful thing. Where is she? The volunteer coordinator. Oh, what would she leave for? She's too humble. Okay, but anyway, it's nice you all work together and just find ways of improving our Buddhist society here and just going by the processes of making peace, being kind, being gentle, as best you possibly can. You see people who come here, be kind to them, welcome them. You don't know who they are. And I sometimes make mistakes. I tell that story of that guy who came to the retreat a few years ago wearing traditional Australian dress, thongs, shorts, and a t-shirt, honestly, and had lots of tattoos on him. And I, th oh, I just, I was terrible. 
And I said to him straight away, I think you've come to the wrong place, the prison farm is up the road. <laughs> I said that, <laughs> really stupid. And then he said, now I'm on this retreat. And I checked his name, he was. I'd never seen him before. He was on the retreat. And then he was the one on that retreat who got a jhana. I couldn't believe it. I'm saying this honestly. And he told me his experience. Wow, it gobsmacked me. He was the last person I thought would even would come on a retreat, let get so deep in meditation. He wasn't faking it. It was real. And that taught me a lesson. You can never judge people. And number two, each one of you has the ability. And imagine that. Ooh. And you're volunteers. You got that extra oomph inside of you. You let go of your time. Let go of your energy to serve something bigger. And then sometimes it happens in meditation. You carry on that letting go, serving the Buddha, not the BSWA. And then you serve and just have some trust. And then soon the mind just really opens up and goes deep inside. It's a wonderful thing to do. So anyway, you start, you think you're volunteering. Like I said on the thing on Friday night, I thought I was volunteering for the, um, the Down Syndrome Institute in Fullborn Hospital outside of Cambridge. And I realized I was getting way more out of this than I ever gave. And I think each one of you, I hope, will be the same. When you get out of this Buddhist society, you give a lot, but you get so much more. And that's as it always is. So, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu to each one of you. And please don't tell your friends about the opportunity to, to serve, otherwise you'll be out of a job. <coughs> you won't have as much opportunity to do stuff. <laughs> For me, service is always a privilege, and you take it quickly before someone else does it. <laughs> That's true, you know, you love doing it. Don't you enjoy doing all of the service you do? If you don't enjoy it, then you're not really doing it properly. You're doing it for fun, for joy, this spiritual empowerment. And then as we do that service, that volunteer for spiritual empowerment, you get so joyful. And that empowers you. If you want to get these jhanas, deep meditation, once you do get inspired, you really help somebody, find a quiet place somewhere here and sit down, close your eyes and really get into it. You get this big oomph of energy. That's, that's a lot of time have I experienced deep states. You just, I don't know why you feel really into it, inspired. You just go for it. And the mind just wants just to go into these deep meditations. And you're perfectly safe. So I'm just going to go around the back here and sit down across my legs. <laughs> if I could. Okay, so well now what do we do? Well, when are we doing the um, the new Buddhists? Can I take a break? <laughs> <laughs> the door's open around the back. <laughs> okay, so four thirty. Okay, so do you want to take a break now for five or ten minutes, and then new Buddhist time. Oh, you shouldn't ask me questions on those deep meditations. I just get... <laughs> Thank you for asking those questions, by the way. <laughs> yeah, but I just, you know, just got really inspired. Hi. Okay, this is the most holy water I've got. Here we go, for your health and happiness. So you'll be the most beautiful girl in Perth and the smartest girl too. And for you too. And for you. Yeah. Happy way sex to you, yes. After, so.
Okay, I'll make a message. Huh? Oh, yeah, why not? Yeah. Oh, not, not that, yeah. No, but they should do, they should do, do their own. Everyone, every center has a phone and a jake, right? So that they are the ones who should be filming and then should be sending to us. Otherwise, we should be looking after them as well, on top of our own. Thank you, thank you. Um, 
Um, it's a very nice, uh, beautiful place. Very, very beautiful place. And um, it's got gorgeous geological features. Yep. It's one of the places that many people should take a pilgrimage actually. No, it's not as fast as it can be. It's a pill room. I think it will be that big event. I think it will be that my brother in law and his, my sister in law are joining us. They're renting a, a pool hall. And they're 70 years old. 70 years old. Oh, you're living in Kalgoorlie? In Kalgoorlie. Oh. Yes, we, we, we drove all the way to Kalgoorlie. It's crazy. I don't recommend it. Why did you do that? Because uh, at the time, we want to see what, what the North One was like. Oh, I see. So we drove there. It's not exactly much there. <laughs> we spent all the time driving.
Okay, we've got to start now. And please don't give I Hasapanya a hard time. It's your birthday. <laughs> we want to make sure that you have a wonderful time. Okay, we're going to do the celebration now for the new members. <laughs> okay, this is especially for those who are joining uh, 
basically the world Buddhist community through the Buddhist Society of West Australia for the first time. And this is an inspiring occasion where we give the three refuges and the five precepts for the first time to many who are either here or overseas. But first of all, those who are here in Western Australia who are taking the three refuges and the five precepts for the first time, can you please come to the front? This is your first time? Oh, wonderful. Have you taken the three refuges and the five precepts before? Okay. Okay, excellent. Okay. Yeah, you can join. Yeah. Hi. Are you all ready there? And the three refuges and the five precepts. And this is also for all of you overseas or interstate. Hi, everybody. Can you see me? Yes, a few people are waving. Well done. Other people look like you're frozen. Anyway, you soon come online. And it's traditional in Theravada Buddhism, taking the three refuges and the five precepts is something which basically makes you a Buddhist. There was somebody years ago, and actually they migrated to a UK, they were an illegal migrant, they came over in like a container, and there was like a person who was fleeing persecution. They were a monk though, and, but they couldn't prove that they were a monk. And then one of the people who started to look after them, they couldn't really communicate to them, but then this person put their hand up and said, Buddhang Savanangachami, Dhammang Savanangachami, Sanghang Savanangachami. And that told the person interviewing them, this is a Buddhist. It's something which you'll recognize throughout the whole world as being a Buddhist. It's not just Perth, it's the whole world. And if any of you ever manage to go to India on pilgrimage and go to places like Bodh Gaya, you can actually hear the, um, the chanting at night time. That's actually, you don't have to do that. That's how it sounded <laughs> on, the, on the loudspeakers. When I first heard that, it was just, to me it was like beautiful. Because now I'm a really sort of strong Buddhist. And you're hearing that, and it just all tears to my eyes. It was chanted in the Indian style. And it was something which you recognized that this was a place. And after that, the whole of Bodh Guy, you could almost hear it every evening. It was um, a recorded chant, but very beautiful. And that inspired me. And with those three refuges, the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, we also take our five precepts. And with those five precepts, you know, it's not deliberately killing a living being, not stealing, not committing adultery, not lying and not taking alcohol or non-medicinal drugs. If the doctor tells you you have to take this drug, some antibiotics, that's fine. It just means the non-medicinal ones. And you know that my friends, when I was young, started taking marijuana, and they said, that's not gonna lead to anything. But it did. You know, one of my best friends, even at school, he started taking marijuana, and he got a scholarship to Cambridge to read a medicine. He's a brilliant man. But of course, once he got into the medical school, he started stealing the, the heroin. And I met him when I went back to visit UK maybe 15 years ago. This brilliant man who could have been a top doctor, all the jobs he could get was mowing lawns on people's houses. And I knew him before and I felt really sad that there was a great person in the making who ended up just doing gardening. And it was a terrible thing to do, so please avoid the drugs. And the, you don't need the alcohol. Am I a happy monk? 
do I look like I'm really depressed or upset? You don't need that stuff. And if anybody ever invites you, please take a drink. You can always tell them, no, I can't drink alcohol because of doctor's orders. Dr. Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> and you're much, much happier in your life. So anyway, you can know where those... Any questions on the three refuges and the five precepts, first of all? And you're all happy to do this. And it gives you so much oomph and energy. But I must also confess to you that when I started going to the Thai temple in London, that was in East Sheen, in Richmond, uh, not the new one they had in Wimbledon. But when I went to that one, I'd been going there so long that one of the monks asked me, it's about time you took the three refuges and the five precepts. And I asked the monk, what are the five precepts? And he explained them to me, and I said, I don't need to take them, I've been keeping them perfectly for the last couple of years. I discovered them myself. And it's, to me it was like common sense, logic. You didn't need to drink. And I said, what do you want to steal for? Other people's money. And they, they, if someone steals from me, in those days you felt sad. And committing adultery, I had a girlfriend at the time. One girlfriend was enough. That was, <laughs> I couldn't afford a second one. And, and it's also just not lying. It's wonderful to be able to tell the truth and feel confident wherever you go. No one's going to find you out. And lastly, the alcohol and drugs things. It was not, not, not necessary. Far happier without them. So anyway, you okay with the, any questions you have about them? Okay, so here we go. And overseas, you all ready? So you can put your hands up, like this. And then I will start the chant with Namo Tassa. When I've finished the three Namo Tassas, then you do the Namo Tassa together. Here we go. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Alahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato <coughs> alahato sama sambuddhasa Now you, but no, no burp. <laughs> okay, na. Is this going through okay, Jake? Yeah, it's going through. Uh, is it it's moving on the laptop? I think I can scroll it on. No, I think, oh, the laptop, some of it is moving. Very good. And so now we do the three refuges. I hope you all can hear it. Buddhang Saranang Gachami. Dhammang Saranang Gachami. Sangang Saranang Chami Dutiampi Buddhang Saranang Chami Dutiampi Dhammang Saranang Chami Dutiampi Sankang Saranangachami Chami Tatiampi Buddhang Saranangachami Tatiampi Dhammang Saranangachami Tatiampi Sankhang Saranang Chami Ti Sarana Gamanang Niti Tang Amabhante You can actually see this and see the meaning on page 9 and 10 of the books. 
these are the three refuges which you have now taken. And please remember, those three refuges are to the Buddha, Dhamma, the teachings, and to the Sangha. We don't take refuge in one particular monk or nun. We don't take refuge in Ajahn Chah or Ajahn Brahm or Ajahn this or Guru that. It's a whole Sangha, the monks and the nuns here, that we are at your service. And I kind of like that, that it's the Buddha and the Dhamma and the Sangha we take refuge in. It's not a guru tradition. And in the end, I have to submit to the authority of the Sangha. When I go back to Bodhinyana Monastery, I can get outvoted. And I kind of like that idea. And uh, Venerable Hasapani can get outvoted by the nuns. Because that's how we work. It's not one individual, but it's the whole group, the Sangha. That's the more important. Okay, so now we have the five precepts. And that is on page 11 and 12. Do you want to do them in Pali or in English? Okay, I know that you want Pali, but anyway, you probably trained in the Pali, but you can see what they mean in English. So here we go. I do them first, and when I finish, then you do them. Panati pata veramanisi kapadang samadhi ami. Adinadana veramanisi kapadang samadhi ami. Kame sutmi chachara veramanisi kapadang samadhi ami. Musawada veramanisi kapadang samadhi ami. Sura Meraya Maja Pamada Tana Veramanisi Kapadang Samadhi Ami And now I do the chant Imani Panchasi Kapadani Silena Sugating Yanti Silena Boga Sampada, Silena Nibuting Yanti Tasma Silang Visodaye. And that last chant, I, you have to focus on it. These are the five training precepts. What happens if you break one of those precepts? Does that mean you're excluded and excommunicated from the BSWA? No, it doesn't at all. It means you're trying your very best to train yourself to do these things. And if you make a mistake, you tell somebody, you know, a good friend, you confess, and then you try and make sure that you do better next time. No punishments. You acknowledge mistakes, forgive them, and learn. And that's how we grow. Don't be afraid of mistakes. That's how we grow. At school, you're always given tests. And you make mistakes, and that's where the teacher learns what they need to focus on next time. It's not a criticizing or, or putting you down. It's just learning what your weaknesses are so those weaknesses can be fixed up. But always remember, that's called the AFL code, Acknowledge, Forgive, Learn. And it's a beautiful code. There's no punishment there at all. And when you're not punished, there's a great incentive to grow and do better every time. You don't need to hide anything. Okay, and it says, through virtue leads to a happy rebirth. That's good karma. And it also leads to prosperity in the world. You know, it's a weird thing. You think that, no, I got to cheat to be rich. But that's not actually how things work. You find when you trust other people, then those other people can get, do good business together. Even monks and nuns, we were talking earlier, that you know, some of the people who do work for us at Bodhinyana Monastery, we've been dealing with them for years. 
And because we've been dealing with them for years, I mean literally 30, 40 years, no, not 30, no, almost 40 years now, that some of those uh, builders or backhoe drivers, they know us so well that sometimes that we just say, please do this, and they just do it. They know the monastery almost as well as I do. And we know they'll never overcharge us. We never need to check them even. You know, obviously we try to do our very best, but they're always so reliable. And because of that, in my life becomes very easy. And it's the trust we build up over the years makes that work. We're honest, we'll always pay our bills. And we'll always just make sure that if they leave something, look, that time when I was the main organizer of the building, I went to Collies, they were the wood uh, suppliers. And I got a whole lot of wood you know, to build a kuti. And then, just because it was very busy, I found out in the bill afterwards, there's about 50 bucks worth of timber, which wasn't on the invoice. We got for free. So what I did was the next morning, I went back to, to Collies. The yard was in Brookton Highway in Kelmscott. I went there and said, I'm sorry, but we got this wood yesterday. We hadn't paid for it. Can we pay for it, please? And so you know, I had a check for them already. And then the guy who took the money looked at me and stared at me in disbelief. He couldn't understand why he got something for free and they came back to pay for it. And he went and said, just wait a moment. And then he went to see the general manager of the store and came back with the general manager and said, and we're very grateful for what you've done. We trust you so much. Now we're going to give you a builder's discount. And that saved us much, much more than 50 bucks over all the years we got timber and other hardware from that place. And that's you know, what happens when you're honest. You tr people trust you, and they save money, you save money. That's why it leads to prosperity. And whenever there's any corruption, it was saying in Singapore, it's one of the least corrupt countries in Southeast Asia. That's one of the reasons why they've got a strong economy. Not for hard work, it's because people can trust one another. And through virtue, it leads to liberation. It supports, you know, first of all, meditation. Whenever I do a, an ordination ceremony for the novices, oh no, for monks, sorry, there's a chant I do at the end that Sila Paribhavito Samadhi Mahapalo Hoti Mahani Sangso. When the meditation is supported by your precepts, you're a good person. It has great power and great benefit. That's what the Buddha said, that's what we teach the new monks every time. And that's so true. You've got good precepts, your meditation just takes off. And that means it supports your liberation. And so that's why you should work to purify your virtue. Be a good person with a good heart. And it's a win-win situation all the way on. So all of you who are overseas, I hope you enjoyed that and now we actually give out the certificates for people some of you are overseas is that correct now where's lucky okay okay so if you are here if not but it's, i'm announcing everybody it might take a little while the first one is in western australia lauren hancock cafe yeah you're number one well done <laughs> here we go Welcome. And you get free gift? Yeah, would you help with giving out these gifts? Yeah. Yeah, you can help, yeah. Here we go. I don't know what's inside here. And this one as well. Yeah. Celebration, why not? Oh, and I remember getting the email from this gentleman, Alexander Sokolov. Yes, he was from Russia, and he said, I know that Russia is a country which is not well liked in the world today. But he said, not all Russians are uh, uh, sort of <laughs> like uh, uh, anti um, other countries or are warlike. And they said, is it okay? Please, can I join the ceremony today? And I said, of course you can. And I'm very happy 
to have this certificate for Alexander Sokolov. I'm f is he there on the... Can we see him? Alexander? Is Alexander in there? I don't know if you are, but anyway, you're most welcome to be part of our Buddhist Society of Western Australia. And I hope it gives you a lot of peace and happiness and know there's so many other people in the world from so many countries who are really good people and trying to do their very best wherever they are. So this will be sent to you by the post. Anna Vogel, she's in Germany. And again from Germany, I hope you are happy. If you actually, and the picture's there, just wave or do something. Anna Vogel, no, okay. But anyway, welcome to our Buddhist Society of West Australia. Adair, Adair, Deveni. Adair, is she here? Who? Oh. Okay. Okay, is Alexander there? No, it's stuck as well. No, okay. No worries. They can hear, I hope. Adair Deveni, is she here? Adair? She's in Western Australia. Okay, she may be just in Northern Western Australia. Oh, I can put it there. Anne Holland Bau, a USA. Welcome to our Buddhist Society of West Australia. Alejandro Garcia in UK. Oh, where's Alejandro? Alejandro? Where, can you wave? Oh, she's frozen. Well, it's UK, and UK is very cold. <laughs> That's why they're frozen. <laughs> I can't resist this stuff. Uh, Brian Lynch from South Africa. If Brian is there, no. This one's frozen too. <laughs> Shouldn't be frozen in over there. But anyway, welcome to our Buddhist Society of West Australia. Birgit Leerheimer in Germany. So, Birgit, welcome to our Buddhist Society of Western Australia. One of our monks has gone to Germany, or going to Germany this evening. That's Sam Venuchitapalo. So I'm not quite sure if you catch up with him in Germany because he's just usually doing a family visit, but he'll be over there in Germany. Charlotte Hakiwai in Western Australia. Charlotte, oh, welcome. Hey, one of these. The Lama Sutta, one of these. Oh, I've already got one of those. What about one of the string things? Oh, you've got one already. Welcome to our Buddhist Society, West Australia, Charlotte. And we have Chandika Dasanayaka in ACT. Christine McDonald in USA. Dangsi Weera Wikrama in Sri Lanka. Uh, Mahinda Raja, no, I'm not reading that correctly. <laughs> Raja Paksa. <laughs> Get into trouble again. Dimitri Sergeev. Ah, hey Dimitri. Very good. Well done. Are you, were you Russian before? Yep, I'm Russian. You're most welcome. Here we go. And here this one as well. And what else we got? That's it. Okay. Damika Surawira in ACT. Enrique, oh, I, like, I love this name. Enrica Bolognese. You're Enrica? No, no. Enrica Bolognese. Because uh, I like Bolognese. And it's so. Enrica, are you there online? Enrica? No, I can't see you. But anyway, welcome to our Buddhist Society of West Australia. Em Emery Enroth from USA. No. Fenny Eng from Indonesia. Fenny? Actually, I think I know her in Indonesia. Gloria Wong in Hong Kong. I know Gloria in Hong Kong. Hiroshi Aihara in Japan. Hi King Jiang in West Australia. Hi King. Yes, well done. Very good. 
and a Kalama Sutta for you, and a book, and a little string with it. Isabella Houston, from Western Australia. Isabella Houston. Okay, sometimes, again, there may be up north somewhere, or down south, or in the middle. Joshua Nernev from USA. Nernay, sorry. Joshua. Kiran Raj from India. There's a lot of Indians actually are Buddhists. And uh, um, yesterday evening I met the head of the Ambedkar Buddhist Society here in Western Australia at the Sri Lankan temples, Waisak. And they're just starting out over here. They're a very vibrant and wonderful group. So, USA, Caviar Anjani. Oops. See, it's got some holy water already. Lai San from Russia, another Russian. You're most welcome. Lena Dahlquist from Sweden. Lena? No. Leo Karanen from USA. Louise Peluse. Louise, oh yeah, we've got one. Yay. <laughs> Very good. Okay, one of these, one of these, and one of these. Well, you get much more than that later on by coming here, but welcome to our Buddhist society. Melvin C. from Singapore. Melvin. Mavis Lim from Singapore. Mina Sadiho from Indonesia. Yeah, I've got that one. Matthew Sadler from UK. Oh my goodness. Malawishi Narayana Sami from Botswana. That's very nice. All the way from Botswana. I spelled that wrong. It's not Botswana, it's Botswana. But it's wonderful that even in Africa. If you're here, welcome. Marianne Tachner from Germany. Marku Nissila from Finland. Finnish as well. It's amazing how many people from all over the world. Max said Wong. Max. Very good. <laughs> Welcome. Very good. Oh, don't go yet. More stuff to get rid of. <laughs> Here we go. And for you. Okay, nice to have you on board. And that, another Max, Max Moresi from USA. Margot Lears from USA. Nirupama Chandiri from India. Nirupama. Namki Choi from USA. Patricia Bullen from UK. Petra Karman from Germany. Ryland Egan from Canada. Rene Hawkins from USA. Stefan Gerstmann from New Zealand. <coughs> Shiani Herawati from Indonesia. Shan Yuan Zhang. Shan Yuan Zhang, Western Australia. You here? No. Okay. Anyway, I'm sure I'll see you in West, from Western Australia. And, oh, I've all finished. And Ulrich. Mecklenburg from UK. Did you get not get any? Okay. So because you've ordained, uh, who's the one who hasn't got any yet? You three. Okay. You didn't get anything. Okay. Come here. Yeah. Sure. This is for you. Well done. Welcome. And who else did get one? Please come up. Yeah. Here are five precepts. <laughs> Very good. We can get you a certificate later. And this one. Please come up. And see how they dress very nicely when they come to our Buddhist society, just like me. And for you as well. Nice to see you. Very good. Welcome. And also the lady in the back over there. Come, please. 
Oh. Because you're the, the last one, we got this special gold one. <laughs> okay, here we go. Excellent. How many other people? Is that all the ones here? So, okay, so what I will do now, for all those people overseas who may be frozen, I'll give you a nice warm chant of congratulations. Can we do the so atolado? Oh, no, te atolado. You know that one? Yeah. No, you don't. Okay. We'll just do the blessing then of Sabaroga. Sabaroga Winimuto Saba Santa Pawajito Saba Vera Mati Gando Nibuto Chatuang Bawa Sabitio We were chant to Saba Rogo we na satumate bowan wantarayo sukidi gayu gopawa apiwa dan hasile sani chang wuta pachalino chataro damawatanti ayuano Sukang Balang Sadhu 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 And if you notice I've got my voice fully back now. A few burps, but still the voice is now strong. And just lastly for those um, who are just taking the precepts, there will be a series of four talks in August this year for the new, peop new people who are taking the precepts outlining the core teachings of Buddhism. Details will be on our website soon. So we're not just going to give you the precepts and abandon you, that if you will need to find out more detail about them, you can always ask one of the monks or one of the nuns, but also there will be some teachings uh, in August. They'll be given here. Here, yes. So you can ask questions and go deeper into those teachings coming soon. And of course you're always welcome to our monasteries. And once you've taken the five precepts, you're also able to book for the meditation retreats. That's sometimes one of the highlights of being a five preceptor. You're a full member of our Buddhist society. You can actually sign up for that. And when we have a retreat, you get, I say the first choice, basically there's no second choice, because they get filled up with all our members. So we welcome you all to our meditation retreats as well, each one of you. Welcome. And now we usually uh, celebrate by offering you a special uh, reception. And that's usually in the hall next door. Yeah, so if you now like to just, what we usually do in Buddhism at the end of a ceremony, having given the blessing to bow three times, and once you've bowed, you can go into the room next door. These are only just for the new five preceptors or their invited guests. <laughs> yeah. And then... So, and the committee people as well. Who's on our committee? Who's our president of our committee right now? This is Hok Chin. Who's our um, vice president? At Kasania. She's not here. Is he in Kasania? No. Uh, no, okay. Who's our secretary? He's not here. And who's our assistant secretary? Oh, he's here. Well, yeah, he's usually doing some of the IT work. How many other committee members have we got here today? Oh, Bill. He's usually organizing the parking. See, we're a hands-on committee here. So we make sure... That, where's our treasurer? He's hands-on the money. <laughs> <laughs> They're all really good people. And these are people who look after our concerns while we're here. So there's only a couple of committee members here. You've got a hard job to do. So anyway, you do it very well. So now we can finish off, and if you want to bow, and then we go into the room next door, and there will be refreshments for you. So thank you again for coming, and nice to have you on board. Our Buddhist Society of Western Australia.
Can't lose it. It's the only copy we've got at the moment. Yeah. Thank you for doing that. Oh, look, some of those people over there are now live. Hi, nice to see you over there. Hi, all of our overseas guests. Thank you for joining, and you'll soon get your um, certificates as soon as we can get them available to you. Nice to see you all. Are oh, there? Okay, yay, I can see you. Who we got here? And you see Gabriel in Austria, Danny Wikuma Rama. You see Gloria, Gloria from Hong Kong. Yeah, hi. And we got Petra, wherever Petra is. Kavia, I can see you in the bottom there. Anna, hi Anna. No, she's, oh no, she's not frozen, good. And Josh. Josh Nurney. Yeah, where are you there? And Stefan Kutlesman. Nice to see you. And Isabella. Hi Isabella. Yeah, she's smiling. Wonderful. And Minna. Nice to see you, Minna. And Patricia. And Ryan. Hi Ryan. And Mariana. And Chandika and Hoshini. And Nirupana. And Uli. Hi Uli. Yeah, great. And oh this is from uh, Botswana. Mariana Narayana Sami, yes. It's great to have someone from Botswana. Excellent. And who else have we got there? You got Emery? Hi Emery. And I think that's all I've got on here at the moment. Oh Matthew. Matthew Sadler. Good to see you all. So nice to see you, every one of you, and I hope to see you. Remember that now that travel is possible, we do go traveling all over the world. And Ajahn Bamari will soon be going to uh, UK and Norway and Poland. So we do travel. If I can't, we can't see you here, we'll see you somewhere in the world. The world is a small place now, and we do try hard to come visit as many people as we can. And we used to have this uh, web page called Where is Ajahn Brahm? And so you can always go on there and find out where I am, where I will be. And sometimes I have to look at that to try and find out where I'm supposed to be next week. <laughs> so I wish you all happiness and well-being and welcome to our BSWA. Okay. Very good. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, I, I should actually, I could sign it quickly, but I have to go now into... Yeah.